In this tutorial series, we're going to run you through the basics of how to make a 2D side scroller in Project Spark. Now, there are a lot of different types of 2D side scrollers out there, so we're going to cover the most basic and often seen mechanics that you might find in a side scroller. And throughout these series of tutorials, we're going to be building them on top of each other, so you're going to end up with something that you could actually make into some finalized game. So the very first thing we're going to cover in this first tutorial is just explaining how to set up a 2D brain for your main character and set up the basic mechanics of how to actually create this 2D environment. So we're in a very blank world right here and we have our default main character right here. The first thing we want to do is go ahead and jump inside their brain. So we're going to hold down left bumper and we are going to hit wide open up their brain. This is the default brain that starts with kind of every character in Project Spark. It's a third person action adventure brain. So um, let's just jump in, take a look at how it looks like. So this is a brain that allows you to kind of move the camera around, move the player around, but it's all in a 3D space. So what we need to do is we need to combine this to a 2D space. Now the difference between a 3D space and a 2D space is the axes it uses. And to illustrate that, we're gonna bring up some rulers. So let's go ahead and find the ruler prop within our prop gallery. We're gonna bring this guy out. So if you have ever taken any sort of math classes that might look at the X and Y axis, this might be familiar to you. So we're creating, we're gonna start with creating two different rulers right here. So we have one ruler, this ruler going up and down. This represents the y-axis. This ruler going left to right, this represents the x-axis. You might have seen this in class before when you had to graph points on, uh, on some sort of graph. So that is actually used in uh, any video game to create its space. Now you only need the y-axis and the x-axis in order for your character to move in a 2D space. You know, they just need to move along this axis right here. What makes it a 3D space is something called the z-axis, which we can go ahead and rotate this around right here and show you the z-axis right here. So the z-axis creates a third axis, which creates this 3D space, but we only need to move on two of these. So what we need to do is we need to constrain our character to only move on two of the three planes. And thankfully, there's a brain that does that for us. So we jump inside the brain for the character again. Let's go ahead and open up our brain options and go to brain gallery. Within the brain gallery, you're gonna see this brain called 2D Side Scroller. So go ahead and click on that. What that creates for you is it creates this 2D Side Scroller brain for your main character that pretty much has everything already set up. So let's go ahead and jump into test. And we see our character is now moving in a 2D space. They're only moving forwards and backwards, up and down, but they can't move front and back. And that is what would make it 3D. So there are two things kind of going on here that makes this into a 2D looking game. It's first locking the axis to just X and Y axes instead of Z, which is front and back. And second, the camera is also positioned to the exact side of the player to make it a side scroller. So let's go ahead, go back into edit, and let's run you through all the things going on in this player's brain. So we're not gonna worry about this left stick dead zone. The first thing we're gonna worry about though is constraining this character to only be moving on one axis. And right here, that's what line three does. Line three is using something known as a number variable in order to store some number and then reference that number at a later point. So what this is doing is let's run you through it. On the do side, what we want to do is we want to store what the character's X position is right here. And then we want to lock that player to that X position. Now this, this scenario is actually locking the X position so the player moves on the Z vector, which is fine. Again, you only need to constrain it to two different axes. So you can either do X and Y or Z and Y. Y is important to keep because Y is up and down. But whether you want them to move on the X axis 
forward and backwards or the z-axis forward and backwards it's going to look pretty much the same to you so let's first start out by making a numbered variable so we go ahead and open up this uh, new code tile go to values go to number and this is where you can create new number variables so let's create a number variable we're going to call it constrain x axis then we're going to set that to be equal to because it needs to be able to store some sort of number. We're going to make it equal to what your current position. So we go to the position folder. Your current position on the x axis is. So we go to position and we choose the x axis right here. That does the exact same thing as the line below it. So we can go ahead and delete that. So the very beginning of the game, under this once tile, once tile means it runs only one time, we are finding what your current position is on the x-axis and storing that number as this number variable called constrain x-axis. Now this number can be in the positives or negatives. It could be something like negative 35 or positive 59 or whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's just looking at the current position of your player and making sure that it knows what that position is. The next thing we want to do is constrain that position. So a position that needs to be constrained, it means we want this to run all the time. So let's go ahead and create a new line here. And on the do side, because we want this to run all the time, we're not going to put anything on the win side. Instead, we're just going to put something on the do side, and that means it's going to continue to run. So on the do side, we want to set its position x. So we go over to position, choose position, and then set x. We want to make that equal to this variable we store up here. Now, this may seem kind of weird. You're setting this variable to be equal to your x position, and then you're setting your x position to be equal to that same number variable that you just defined. This seems like it would be some weird loop, right? Wrong, actually, because this is under 1. So this means this number is stored just one time, the very beginning of the game. But this runs all the time. And what that means is that at all times, your x position has to be equal to this initial stored number. And that is what locks your movement on that x vector to make it so that it can't move. You can only move now on the y vector or the z vector. Now we can go ahead and remove this down here, which was doing something similar in line 7. So those two are great. Let's, but let's go ahead. I'm just going to uh, ignore this line, this boom camera line. But let's show you the importance of a good camera. So on the do side here, we're just going to go ahead and add a camera uh, follow camera. That's kind of the default camera that starts with our character. So we're going to have a follow camera here. We're going to go into test mode. We have our character. We can move this camera around them. But watch what happens is as we're moving, this character is getting stuck because, you know, we've constrained them to one vector, but our camera can move in whatever vector we want it to. And this can really confuse the, the player where they're not able to know exactly what's forward and what's backwards and what makes you properly able to walk within a 2D side-scrolling map. So you need to also constrain the camera so that this issue doesn't happen where you have a character who's kind of stuck in, in the mud here. And to do that, we can employ a new type of camera called a boom camera. So we're going to take this follow camera code tile, click on that, and you're going to see this boom camera code tile. The nice thing about a boom camera is you can set exactly its rotation and how far away it is from the player, its exact pitch. What we want to do is we want to have this looking at exactly the side of the player because that's what makes it a side scroller. So let's go, and for now, let's just do boom camera. Let's not do anything else. Go back into edit. But you'll see this boom camera is locked in sort of an isometric format. And what I mean by that is it's about diagonal um, of the player, so it's not fully frontal on them. And in order to make it fully frontal, we need to make some or put some modifiers on that. So let's jump back into our player brain again. Let's start adding modifiers on this boom camera. So in order to get its pitch to be exactly the same level as the character, 
and its yaw to be exactly at the side of the character, we want both to be set at zero. So we go ahead and select yaw, we go to values, number, go to numbers, and you'll find zero right here. And then let's add another code tile, go to modifiers, go to position, pitch, and set that as well at zero. So now we have a boom camera with a yaw that's set at zero and a pitch that's set at zero. Go back into test. And now look at that, we are properly moving back and forth. So that's great, but a really important part of a 2D side scroller is how far away the camera is from the player. You might have an initial inclination to have the camera close up on the player so you can see all the great details, but that makes it pretty hard to navigate in a 2D space. So we want to push this camera back. So let's go back into test mode, or edit mode, sorry. Go to that brain, and we can also add a modifier for uh, distance onto this boom camera. So we go to position, distance, and uh, if you notice from the line below, the one we've kind of ignored, which does most of the same stuff here, that had set a distance of 15, and that's in meters, so 15 meters. That's, a, that's actually a great amount of space, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna go to, uh, we went to values, number, and now we're gonna type in a new number right here. We're just gonna type in 15 right there. And now this has set this camera to be 15 meters away from our player. So this uh, does make the player appear smaller, but it also shows off a lot more of our space we're going to be moving in. There are, other, there are two other important modifiers here that you might notice on this line six. We have this ignore prop collision code tile and this ignore terrain collision code tile, which are going to be great later on in our tutorial series. So we're going to go ahead and add in these modifiers. What they basically do is if this camera is bumping into a prop, it just goes right through it. It doesn't collide with it and try and get around it. So that will make the camera always at exactly 15 meters away from the player, whether or not it's hitting props and whether or not it's also hitting terrain. The initial brain also had this ignore jumping tile. And what that did is that would make it so when our player jumps, then the camera doesn't follow them. It only follows them when they're they are on solid ground. That's actually something we don't want to include because we're gonna get into things like bounce pads and moving platforms where you're gonna want that camera to stay on the player as they move up and down an elevation. So we're not gonna worry about adding that. We can go ahead and now get rid of line six. Let's just jump in a test one more time. And you see we are a nice good distance away from the player and they, they are again properly moving back and forth. The last thing to cover is the actual movement. And that's kind of important. So that's what line seven and eight do right here. And this may look kind of confusing at first, but uh, it has logic behind it. So on the win side, we have win left stick in the X axis, well, that's weird, is greater than this number variable left dead zone. So you look down at a controller and what you'll start to notice is say look down at left stick or at right stick. They can move on two axes, uh, X, which is uh, left and right, and Y, which is up and down. So we can actually use that to do some interesting things here. And the interesting thing we're doing here is we're looking for when our left stick is moving left or right, then we are moving camera left or camera right. So the central point of a stick or its resting point is zero on the X axis, zero on the Y axis. If we hold on the x-axis or go uh, with the controller to the left side, that is going in the negative numbers because it's sort of on the left of the graph. If we go to the right side, that is in the positive numbers because it's, it's in the positive moving format of the graph. So that's what this is doing here. It's evaluating basically if our x on our left stick is greater than this number variable. And what is this number variable? Right now, it's here, it's set at 0 0.15. What does that actually mean? Well, if the resting point of a controller is zero, then 0 0.15 is a bit off the resting state, so that allows you to have a controller that is, you know, say you have a controller where it's only slightly directed in one direction, then your character won't really move too much. And the nice thing about here is we're having the character move directly in the camera's right direction or the camera's left direction, 
which is great because this allows you to move on sort of where the camera is seeing is left or right rather than trying to figure out where the player's left and right is or forwards and backwards is, which causes lots of problems. So this is the simplest way of doing that. So hopefully that gives you a brief understanding of just the makeup of a 2D side-scroller brain. In the next tutorial video, we're going to run you through sort of the basics of how to design a 2D space for your 2D side-scroller.